Mentoring Project of the last couple years in the upper central region of the 1886 Charleston earthquake. This figure you see here is just a representation of our study area, and I'll be discussing that in a couple minutes. Okay, well, I first want to point out why we should even study seismic hazard on the East Coast, because when most people think about high risk or high seismic hazard, they think of the West Coast and the San Andreas Fault and all of that. But thanks to the Virginia earthquake in 2011, now most people seem to realize that there's also prominent seismic hazard on the East Coast, so it's important to study. Due to the interest of time, I won't go over in detail on this slide what I'll be talking about, but this gives a general overview. But what I do want to point out are um, the seismic hazard map examples I've provided here. The top one is for South Carolina. It, um, it shows peak ground accelerations as a percentage of the gravitational constant G, where the warm colors represent high percentages and the cool colors represent the low, the low percentages. And what's shown here is for each given color, there's a 2% chance that that uh, particular peak ground acceleration will be exceeded in 50 years. So that's pretty much what a seismic hazard map shows. The, the figure on the bottom is a more generalized seismic hazard map, um, probably with a similar statistical analysis as above, but it's just done by color, not by peak ground acceleration. And you can see they also plotted the earthquakes on record um, with dots where the relative sizes represent relative earthquake magnitudes. And the important point there is in areas of high seismic hazard, you see a correlation with recorded earthquakes, and that's pretty much expected. So I want to start by talking about the 1886 Charleston earthquake. The reason <coughs> the earthquake is so important, even though it happened a long time ago, is because if it happened again today in the same place with the same magnitude, it would be the most devastating earthquake on record in terms of financial loss, straight from Dr. Chapman's mouth, basically. <laughs> so uh, the magnitude was about a seven, and it's the largest earthquake on the East Coast. As of now, the damage is 23 million total in 1886, and I want to point out that would be probably several billion dollars if it translated into present day. You can see the damage in the pictures. I guess the bottom, it, it's kind of hard to tell with the black and white, but the bottom picture shows a derailed train, maybe a train engine. But So you can see the other statistics there. The main point about this earthquake that's interesting is that its geologic cause and its tectonic setting have been pretty uncertain until recently. So I'm talk, gonna talk now about the two previous studies done to try to characterize this geologic, um, geologic cause of the earthquake and its tectonic setting. Um, the studies were 2008-2010 by Dr. Chapman and Jake Beal. The data set is from a series of seismic reflection profiles collected in 1975 through 1983 of the USGS and several collaborators. You can see that the, the bottom figure here, you can see different colored lines there that represent the seismic profile lines. They're actually individual stations shown by dots, but they're so close together that they look like lines. The um, yellow ones are the Virginia Tech ones that, that we got our data from, well, they got the data from. The blue show the USGS lines, and the green is another organization that I can't think of on the top of my head right now. But reprocessing steps, and again, I don't have much time to go over each of these in detail, but Briefly, there was a geometric spreading correction done to the reflection profiles, which corrects for the energy um, dissipating with like, as uh, spherical wave fronts travel through the earth, it naturally um, dissipates the energy. So that tries to correct for that. And then there's minimum phase filtering and the spiking deconvolution done to improve the resolution of the data. Other reprocessing steps that I didn't list that are pretty normal include normal move out correction, which corrects for the offset because as your receivers get further away from your source, there's an offset correction, your reflections are more curved <coughs> than they should be. So there was that done, velocity analysis and stacking, which improves your signal to noise ratio, so you can see the reflections more clearly. 
Other studies done with this area included magnetic and gravity anomaly studies. You can see with the top figure, that's a magnetic anomaly map, where the darker shaded regions um, represent areas of high magnetic anomaly. And as you can see, the epicentral region is also an area of a high magnetic anomaly, so that makes it interesting in that aspect as well. So their results um, in included several reflection profile, um, profiles. Uh, I'm going to talk about the VT3, which shows uh, the results most clearly with the fault. It's still kind of hard to see if you're not used to looking at a, a reflection profile, but I'm going to talk about the basin first. The profiles imaged a Mesozoic extensional basin of at least four kilometers depth with an extensional fault system at its interior. They also know the depth from borehole data, and I say at least because the boreholes go to about four and they haven't they haven't uh, dug any deeper than that to my understanding, but everyone seems to think it's actually, the basin is actually extends deeper than four kilometers. The basin is composed of mafic volcanic rocks shown by the magnetic anomaly maps, and it is associated with a zone of localized continental rifting, which will be important for the next couple of slides, but now for the reflection profile, which I think most easily shows the evidence of the faults involved in the epicentral region. So you see this really clear reflection. It's probably the, one of the first things you noticed about it. That represents a, an unconformity, and the J stands for Jurassic. It separates the boundary between the Cretaceous sediments and the mafic basaltic Mesozoic rocks. And Oh yeah, the basaltic rock shown by the bees here. You can kind of see where the bees are plotted that there's a kind of an offset or a kink-like looking thing in the reflections. That is clear evidence of a fault projecting through it. And you can kind of see it in each of these. The diffractions you see over here are shown basically because when the layers are offset, the truncated part of the layers will create those diffractions. The main point about this map, though, is this fault C, which they think is, which they propose to be one of the major faults involved in causing the 1886 earthquake and in modern South Carolina seismicity. So this fault, I want to point out, it kind of goes up and curves up to here, if you can see the little kinks. They they interpreted it to go up to the surface, but as you can see from this, the first 0.1 seconds, which translates to about 100 meters, uh, were not resolved. They, they just weren't shown, but it's still interpreted that that fault went up to the surface. So the last point about this reflection profile is the slip orientation they derived from it. So with their offsets, they um, the offset shown near fault C, they propose the offsets to be in, in up into the southeast kind of direction, and that's indicative of reverse motion. So if everybody remembers the blocks from here, when you have a reverse <laughs> fault, it goes up, the hanging wall goes up, and you get a overall compression. So that's why they um, interpreted evidence for a compressional reactivation of the Mesozoic faults. So the modern seismicity of South Carolina, like I said before, is very much associated with the epicentral region of the 1886 earthquake. All the earthquakes that occur, and by modern I mean about 1970s to present, they all mostly occur in close proximity with the epicentral region, minus a few little outliers here, probably by their own regional faults. But as you can see from this map, this is literally just taken from the USGS site and shows the earthquakes that have been recorded. It's hard to see the legend, but they all occurred within um, a relatively shallow depth. I think it says like 0 to 60 kilometers or something like that. So they're relatively shallow earthquakes. And you can see this cluster here, very close proximity with the epicentral region I've been talking about. The other thing 
is that the presence of this Mesozoic basin and the localized continental rifting that I talked about earlier imply that this region is actually a failed rift zone, much like the East African Rift and the Rhine Graben, and I've blown up the figure of the study area here so you can kind of see it. And it's really not just South Carolina. It also, it's part of a bigger system called the South Georgia Rift, which includes areas of Georgia and Florida. So, but the problem with all of the data we have so far and the fault geometry interpretations is that it's still kind of an insufficient resolution because we just don't have enough data, I guess. I'm going to talk about it in a second. So that's why we have this current project going on, which we've named the Dense Seismic Network Project. It took place in August 2011 through August 2012. The goal was to better define the seismicity of South Carolina by resolving the fault geometry using earthquake events. So we have about a year of data acquired that Jake and Dr. Chapman deployed the... Oh, wrong one. <laughs> so... Uh, you can see the stations are marked in by the red triangles. So those are the stations they deployed. And they just sat there for a year and recorded anything that went on. So with the processing now, we took all of that data and we're looking at the seismographs and we are finding events, basically. Anything that could be a small earthquake. And those magnitudes are going to be anything less than three. Basically, so Jake has done all of that. I've just been confirming his like wave phase time arrival so far. So here are all the ones he's located. And as you can see, it may be surprising, but it's very active over here in terms of the small earthquakes. He's identified almost 100 of these so far, and we're not even finished yet. So it's going to generate a lot of data. So the future work um, would be the completion, obviously, of locating all of those earthquakes within the data set and making sure the arrival times are as close and as accurate as we can get it so we can resolve the geometry of the fault. And by resolving the geometry, I mean, more specifically, estimation of focal mechanisms and focal depths. I'm gonna start with focal depths because it's easier. Uh, focal depth is another name for a hypocenter. Most people, when they hear about earthquakes, they hear about the epicenter, but that's just the surface projection of the hypocenter. The hypocenter is where the earthquake actually ruptured. Now the focal mechanism is a little trickier. So if you have this half sphere where the earthquake source is located in the kind of the middle of it, you can define fault orientation lines where they intersect with the sphere. Now the problem remains how do you define where those lines go? And that's partly why I've been identifying these P wave and all these arrivals because I guess, in hindsight, I probably should have included a graphic, but I'm just going to have to draw it. So you have your focal mechanism. I know not everybody can see, but if you look at each individual event I was talking about, if you look at the P wave arrival, if the polarity of that P wave arrival goes up, you plot a plus by convention. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> okay, so, and if the P wave goes down, you have a minus just by convention. And then when you get a bunch of these, you can define the lines of the focal mechanisms. But as you see, the focal mechanisms have two different solutions. And for the slope direction, what we do there is we plot all the earthquakes and see how they align and we choose the appropriate solution. So like I was saying earlier, the results will address the <coughs> orientation of the fault geometry and the thickness of the seismogenic zone which is just a zone defined by where earthquakes are likely to occur. I have all of those here, if you uh, are familiar with those terms. Um, and we also have another relationship with other regional faults. Characterizing, the main point here is characterizing the seismicity and hazard of the epicentral region. Uh, if we have a good standard for that, we can use that to define seismicity more easily for regions for say in the same rift zone like Georgia and Florida, we can also compare large events. Like Dr. Chapman compared the 2011 Virginia earthquake with the 1886 earthquake, found some similarities. <laughs> so we're hoping to use a similar analysis for Virginia to better find Virginia seismicity. Ah. And there was a better graphic, I don't know where it went, but it was of Lindsay Sabie's son uh, demonstrating all of it. But this is just a friendly reminder of what to do if an earthquake happens. So, thank you.